Welcome to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on Jewish history, the Bible, Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. Find out more about David's upcoming classes, publications, and other recorded lectures by visiting davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. This lecture on Kvitzat Haderech, Instant Travel, was recorded in Melbourne in 2015. Mordechai wrote to me uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, would I speak to this group for Malava Malka? And I wasn't quite sure what the topic should be. And I said, uh, what is the level of knowledge of this audience on a scale of 1 to 10? Oh, about 12. I, I said, uh, and, and for that purpose, uh, 1 would be barely reading Aleph Base, and 10 would be Rosh Yeshiva of Ponovich. <laughs> and he wrote back and he said, about eight or nine. Uh, So obviously that uh, freaked me out a little bit more because once again I wasn't sure exactly and then I suddenly realized that in fact there was a perfect topic to be speaking about and I'm going to talk for a few minutes about this topic. It will be familiar to some of you but I want to go into a little deep and it's very appropriate for a Saturday night. The subject I want to talk to you just for a little while about is uh, it will be very dear to your hearts and it's, uh, it's a theme that runs fr- right through Chazal and even uh, right through Kabbalistic literature but we don't know a lot about it and so I thought that it would be worthwhile exploring this for a few minutes. It is the theme which Chazal refer to as Kvitzas Haderech. Uh, Kvitzat Haderech literally which means jumping the way and what it actually Uh, refers to is uh, thaumaturgic teleportation is its official name and we would know it more commonly by the term instant travel instant travel that is that uh, you can go from one place to another Uh, I before I even I know that some of you will already will already be wanting to ask me so I will deal with this right away at the start is that uh, there are many Kabbalistic books that discuss in considerable detail aspects of Kvitzas Haderech. Uh, none of them talk about frequent flyer points. <laughs> so those of you who are interested in that, I can't help you. Uh, but we know that it had actually, Kvitzas Haderech actually has two different meanings. Uh, one meaning, which seems to be the meaning that Chazal talk about when they talk about the, the Ovois, the patriarchs, Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov going from one place to another instantly. They understand Kvitzas Aderech as the fact that the earth actually folds. It is the earth that moves. So the place of the destination suddenly becomes very proximate to the place of departure and suddenly they're there. We have a very famous Gemara that some of you would be familiar with in Sanhedrin uh, where it talks about uh, several biblical figures that were able to perform this trick. Uh, it talks about uh, Avraham, it talks about Eliezer, it talks about Avishai bin Suruya. Uh, and in fact, there is an aspect of instant travel applying to all of the patriarchs. We have it by Avraham. We have it by Avraham, according to some of Farshim, understood the concept of instant travel when he was sitting there and he lifted his eyes and he saw already suddenly three people were standing there and therefore say some of Farshim he understood that they had arrived there by instant travel because he didn't really see them coming and we also understand that when he took Yitzchak to Har Hamiri you're going like that does that mean there's a problem there? ah well yes yes but Malachim Malachim can obviously do that but it, the, the, Rav Yosef Kara writes in his parish on Torah that he talks about how it was needing Fritzes Aderech. I mean, yes. The Malachim doesn't mean they can't do it. It's the real Pele is when humans can do it. But never, nevertheless, they appeared suddenly. So that's how he understands it. Um, Avram takes Yitzchak to Haro Maria by, uh, by Kvitzes Aderech. Um, and of course, Eliezer arrives in uh, Aram Naharaim where he was going by Kvitzes Aderech. Yaakov arrives in Haran and then Bet-El through this instant travel. So we see it by the Avot that there's quite a number of of cases. But if we move 
a little further, if we move a little further from Chazal's discussion of the Avot, uh, we find in fact that this concept of instant travel is actually taken so seriously that it is in fact incorporated into some aspects of halachic literature. There is a discussion, some of you will be familiar with this discussion, in Masechet Yovomus. Uh, there's a guy who wrote a get, he wrote a divorce for his wife uh, in Sura, and they bring witnesses and they say it's impossible, he couldn't have written that in Sura because we were with him in Nahardea on that day, a entirely separate town, and one of the opinions, now I think it's the opinion of Rava, discusses the fact that that's not a problem because he could have got there by instant travel by Kvitzas Aderech and Rashi tells us there that the use of Kvitzas Aderech is done through the use of the pronouncement of a specific divine name and you're there. Rashi's understanding of Kvitzas Aderech as some of you would be aware is also found in that Gemara on Erovin in Erovin Mem Gimel where it talks about Kvitza talks about that there are some domains on Shabbos that are above a certain height and the Gemara says Kvitza jumping up and Rashi says that's talking about instant travel through the use of a name and that understanding of Kvitza is incorporated by the tour when he says Yesh Tchumin Lamala Ma'asara there are some domains that are higher and you can use the and the question is is that a type of travel or not? Can you go from one Shabbos domain to another using Kvitzas Aderech? And in fact, the tour seems to Paskin there. It's not entirely clear, but the tour seems to Paskin there that uh, if you're going to get enter in one domain and exit another, you can't do that. Uh, but you might be able to do it if it's in the same domain. But what he understands as Kvitzas Aderech is it's a type of a type of floating through the air. So you're at a certain height and you're floating through the air. So already the rabbis are taking this concept seriously enough that they're actually incorporating it into a halachic discussion. But there's no real detailed discussion of what is actually involved in the act of instant travel. There is, there is a passage in Zohar, it's a very interesting passage in the Tikkun Zohar, where these two rabbis meet uh, this lame person along the way and it's Erev Shabbos, it's a few minutes before Shabbos, and he says, he invites him to his place, he goes a little while away, they go, how are you going to get there in time? And he says the name of 42, he pronounces the Shem Membet, the name of 42, the 42 letter name, and Vum, or the name equaling 42, and Vum, they're there at a distance of some 1500 miles away. But once again, we know it involves the pronouncement of a divine name, but that's all we hear about it. The most detailed and interesting, the first detailed and interesting discussion of a case of Kvitzat HaDerech is found in the responsa of Rav Hai Gaon. Rav Hai Gaon was asked, can you please explain this to us? <coughs> because recently, and this was written to him from Spain and it came via Spain from a community in France and in those days when we're talking in the 10th and 11, early 11th centuries everything was happening in Babylonia if you were living in some loch in Germany and you put a milchik spoon in a fleshy cup and you didn't know what to do you'd have to write back to Babylonia and wait three months for the answer so they write to him and they go we've recently had some appearances from Rav Natronai Gaon over here, one of the big Gaonim, and we're assuming, and he told us, he's appearing there through Kvitzas Aderech, through instant travel. So Rav Hai Gaon ha has to explain to them that given that <laughs> Rav Natronai Gaon's been dead for about a hundred years, this probably wasn't a case of Kvitzas Aderech. This was a case, in fact, of someone who said they were doing Kvitzas Aderech and not in fact the real thing. He says, however, despite my skepticism about that, he said, you should know that Kvitzas Aderech is a real thing. You can actually do it. 
and he goes into tremendous detail about a very, very interesting case that happened during the times of the Gemara, which is alluded to in different places. Tosfus talks about it, but no one gives the full story. Rav Haigaon gives the full story. And it involves the father. It's an extremely bizarre story I'm about to tell you. So just buckle up for this one. The father of Shmuel, not Shmuel the Novi, but Shmuel the Amora in the Gemara, was always referred to by the Gemara as Avua de Shmuel, the father of Shmuel. Some of you are smiling because you know this story, but Rav Hai Gaon goes into great detail about this and a whole shakla vataria there. So we, we know that there was some debate about who exactly Shmuel's father was. And the reason for the ambiguity, explains Rav Hai Gaon, is because according to a lot of people, he wasn't actually there at Shmuel's conception. He was in fact on business in a faraway city. Rav Hai Gaon tells us that this father of Shmuel, who in fact himself was a very righteous man, was transacting business and at some point entered into a business transaction with a woman who had connections with the supernatural. She would listen to what birds are talking. She was into astrology. She had those sorts of connections. And Rav Hai Gaon writes there that in the course of their transaction, she was trying to convince him to do a certain Avera. You don't need a massive imagination to work out what that Avera probably involved. And she gives him, in her attempt to persuade him, she gives him a sum of money. And he goes, what's this for? And she said, because I've heard through the supernatural media that you are destined to conceive a great and holy sage tonight. At which point, the father of Shmuel does an instant travel, goes straight back home, has relations with his wife, and then places himself straight back in the city where he was hundreds of miles away and continues transacting. So they asked him, they ask several important questions on this. Rav Haigaon goes into some I mean, imagine the poor, <laughs> the poor wife. She's sitting at home. She thinks her husband's hundreds of miles away. Suddenly he's there and, you know, it's, he has to do things and then he goes. And they're saying, no, it's more bizarre than that because not only the discussion of how did he know that she was even going to be in a position to do that, you know, to do with Nido or anything like that. So they go into some discussion about that. And then they say something else remarkable as well which if you think about it, is incredible. They said that, they ask, fair enough that he uses a divine name to travel hundreds of miles back home to make love to his wife. He uses that because that's a mitzvah. But how is he possible to use the divine name to get back just to finish his business transactions? So they say, therefore, Kvitsada Derech must work like a return trip. You can have one kavana, one intent, one use of the divine name for a return trip. But if you do that, there cannot be a hefsik. Meaning, just like when you wash your hands before a mozi, you can't talk to anyone. So not only did he suddenly appear in front of his wife, he couldn't even explain what he was doing there. He couldn't talk to her and... He just had to do what he had to do and then whiz back. So the entire scenario becomes uh, quite, quite bizarre. But that, all of that would appear to be through the use of the divine. It's a certain divine name. Actually, the Shach actually writes that it's not a 42 name. It's, an, it's the name of 87 and he has a whole, but there's a use of divine name. But we seem throughout the whole of literature dealing with instant teleportation, we seem to have four basic methods that seem to come out of Kabbalistic literature. One is the use of divine name. And this seems to be the use that the, that the Zohar seems to use, that Rashi seems to use, that probably of Haigaon seems to use. But there's also another way which we would probably refer to as magical technology. You're listening to Collected Talks of David Solomon. Your support can really make a difference. If you enjoy these lectures, please consider rating or reviewing this podcast or simply telling others who may be interested. 
Now, let's get back to the lecture. The, the book, there's a very, very, very obscure Kabbalistic Sefer, some of you might be familiar with it, uh, appeared in the 14th century called Brit Menucha, Bris Menucha. Very, very, very difficult Sefer to understand. Even for people that have been through the Zohar and the Ari and everything, they sit down with this book, they don't know what's going on there. Everybody says that. Really, really difficult book. But there's one chapter towards the end of Brit Menucha, which is very, very clear. And it tells you, I'm now going to tell you how to do Kvitzas Aderech, how to do instant travel. And an entire chapter on tremendous technical detail. And the basic, basic technique is this. You have to take a ram's horn, like a chauffeur, but I mean fresh from the head of a ram. So obviously this ram has to be shechted and then it's got to be cut off in a certain way. And you take this ram's horn, I'm not even sure I'm allowed to tell you all this, but anyway. You take this ram's horn and you stick it in the ground. Yeah, you're nodding your head, you're familiar with this. And then you, and then you yeah, yeah, I was wondering how you got here. And then, then you water it every day. You water it. And after seven days, there begins to grow this kind of reed or stick comes out of the chauffeur and you keep watering and as you're watering it by the way you got to talk to it so there's all sorts of things you got to tell it about what you want it to be and and all sorts of formulas and eventually this reed will grow till it's kind of seven knots long so it's probably about that long and then you drill a hole in the middle of it then you put a cloth with certain formulas on it inside the reed and then this stick kind of like a, a wand or a, like a broomstick becomes your means of travel the Brimanucha says you then just go outside the town and you face in the direction you want to go and you tell the stick where you want to go and whoosh, suddenly you'll find yourself outside the town that you were in the Brit Menucha also even tells you what you should be doing while you're traveling. It says that you're supposed to s sit on the stick and you have one hand in front of you and another hand behind you, so it's like this. <laughs> I, I, I've actually, uh, when I first read this, I was so inspired that I kind of tried it. And I was kind of glad that it didn't work because I think I would have been more blown away if it had worked. I don't think I would have recovered from that. So, magic is another technique. Another one which the Ari talks about a lot is the concept of harnessing the power of demons. We don't really understand what that might mean, but it's harnessing the power of demons. We, I'll talk about that in a moment. And the fourth type of Kvitsaladerek, which is a much more modern, which you see much more in Hasidic literature, is that you can arrive at prof a level of meditation a level of kind of holiness and meditation that's basically a prophetic level where your mind your, is so powerful that it's able to draw your body to where the mind is thinking. So the mind goes to a place and then is actually able to draw the body after it, which is a very, very interesting technique. And that technique we actually see in kind of other spiritual systems. The Tibetan yogis talk about that kind of thing as well. So it, it, it may not be easily dismissible. But we start really to see more and more discussion of Kvitsas Aderech regarding the Rishonim. And probably the Rishon about whom it's discussed the most is in fact the Ramban, Nachmanides. We know that the Ramban was one of the greatest Kabbalists of the 13th century in Spain. And what's not often known is that the Ramban was in fact only came to Kabbalah relatively late in his career. When he was a young man, the Ramban was a great scholar. He was also a physician. He was recognized as one of the meteoric stars of Spanish Jewry, but he was never really interested in the mystical life. And great, there were great, great Kabbalists and mystics living around Spain at the time, especially in Gorona where he was living. And they would come to him and say, ha, you're the Ramban. You really, really should be learning this material. And he goes, ah, it's not for me. 
And then one day, probably the greatest Kabbalist of Gorona at the time, Rav Azriel of Gorona, performed an act of Kvitzus Aderech. And it seems that they always perform these things on Erev Shabbos. Erev Shabbos seems to be the time when most people want to do kvitza. They've either got to get some of the Shabbos or get there and back before Shabbos. There's a lot of literature about people doing kvitza on Erev Shabbos. So Rav Azrael Garona was coming back, was coming back from some mystical mission, back to Garona, and he lands, he lands in a brothel. He doesn't mean to. He's either like, you know, I'll come back to Gorona. And you can't always control exactly where you're going to land. And he lands in a brothel. And apparently in a very, very compromising situation. This whole thing is recorded in great detail in Seder Adoras. So they, so he's arrested. And he's summarily tried. There's some very cruel civic rulers. And they decided they're going to teach this old Jew a lesson. They're going to kill him. And they're going to burn him on Shabbos. So he sent, Rav Azura Garona sends to the Ramban, and he says, could you come down here, please, and be Melitz for me? The Ramban says, actually, no. And he says, look, my, I'm, I'm, you've got my sympathies, he goes, but I'm not going to get involved in that. You were found in a brothel. It's kind of a chilul Hashem. I don't really want to get involved in that. So Rav Azura Garona says, not a problem. Set a place for me by Shalashudas, and I'll be there. And then it goes into great detail, blah, blah, boom, and Rav Israel Garona was able to do other Kabbalistic tricks, and then he fits it himself again, and he turns up at the Ramban's place for Shalashudas, and the Ramban is so blown away that he says, you know what, you better teach me some Kabbalah. So, in fact, uh, he learns it. The Ramban became so great at the technique of Kvitzat Aderech that we have another record of the, of the Ramban's ability to actually make other objects move through Kvitzat Aderech, so, in fact, we have a story where he was able to write the formula for Kvitzas Aderech and put it in a boat. And he wasn't even in the boat. And the boat sailed where it needed to sail. So, the, he became... And there's other Roshanim as well, which we won't go into now because time is pressing, but, you know, Eliezer of Worms and... Uh, of of Kvitzas all all engaged in Kvitzas Aderech. It's a very interesting story if we move on to the more demonic, and the Ari tells us that all Kvitzas Aderech is done by Shadim. It's all, what you're really doing is you're harnessing the power of demons who fly instantly all the time, and they just take you where you need to go to. There's a famous story about Rav Chaim Vital, who was found in, uh, he found himself in Jerusalem, he was in Jerusalem visiting, and you know that in Jerusalem there's a, a natural spring underneath Jerusalem near Harabais called the Gichon, that was actually sealed up by Chizkiyahu Amelech back in the times of the first temple. And so the authorities in Jerusalem, the Ottoman authorities got wind of this and they asked around who could unseal it. And they said, well, it's a very difficult thing to unseal that. The only person who could probably do that is Chaim Vital. They go to Chaim Vital, the Malchu, and they say to him, you need to unseal the Gichon now or we're going to kill you. Chaim Vital does a Kvitzas Aderech, an instant transportation and takes himself to Damascus. The Ari comes to him that night in a dream and says to him, what are you doing? So he, so he tells him, I, I, I jumped, I, did, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to open the Gichon. Why not? Says the Ari, because it would have involved the use of divine names. He said, if you haven't, hadn't used a divine name to escape to Damascus, I would have kept quiet. But now that you, what you should have done is open the Gichon. If you'd opened the Gichon at that time, you would have affected the Geula. And Rav Chaim Vital has, so says, maybe I should go back now and do it. And the Ari says, no, 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 the time has passed. So all of, all, and in fact, uh, the discussion there in Shara Gilgulim and other places regarding the Ari's uh, and his students' concept of Kvitzah um, Saderich is it's not just the utilization of demonic powers, but in fact there are specifically uh, demonic horses there are horses that exist in the demonic realm, in the realm of the Shadim, and you use those. But uh, <coughs> I'll finish really with moving a little forward uh, in the, what, the, what we call the post-demonic. And that is, and because it's Saturday night and it's often a minhag to sit around and tell stories of the, uh, of the Baal Shem Tov and so on on Saturday night. But the Baal Shem Tov, of course, once we move to the 18th century, 
was extremely well known for getting around on Kvitsa Zederich. There are literally thousands of stories of the Baal Shem Tov appearing here and appearing there instantly. Uh, there are many. W- one of my favorites is the, uh, is the story. It's, it's not such a good story, but it's just very funny. Is the, uh, is the story that, uh, of, a, of, a, of a big rabbi that was sitting at the back of the base Midrash and decided that he would delve into some philosophical texts because he wanted to know what was going on in philosophy. And he's reading there and suddenly he starts to have uh, all sorts of deep and complex intellectual thoughts. The Baal Shem Tov in another town uh, apprehends this causes himself to jump immediately in front of this rabbi in the base midrash and says to him, look, I'm a fool, says the Baal Shem Tov, but even I know that there's a God. And there's only one God and it's Yachid Umayyuchid. And the guy's just blown out like, how? How would you even know that, uh, that what I was thinking and so on? And the Baal Shem Tov suddenly disappears back. But the story probably that I'm going to, I just want to, Endor, which is a Hasidic story, really, which is because we're about to enter Elul. So it's sometimes good to think of ways in which we can take a subject and, uh, and really learn from it uh, and take it into the next kind of phase of the Jewish calendar. And that is that uh, there's a story told of Simcha Bunim of Peshischa. A guy came to him, a guy came to Rav Simcha Bunim, and he says to him, You know, I was reading in Kabbalistic books that if you fast for 40 days, if you fast for 40 days, you'll have a revelation of Elijah. I tried that, he says, and it didn't work. And I want to know why. So Rav Sibu Khabunim looks at him and he says, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about the Baal Shem Tov. And from this story, I'm hoping you'll understand why it didn't work. It says the Baal Shem Tov was very famous for using Kvitsa Saderech to jump around everywhere. And sometimes it wasn't always appropriate to use that means of travel, to, or at least to be seen to be using that mode of travel. So what the Baal Shem Tov would do is he would take a couple of horses and he would strap them to a wagon and he would go outside the town and when he was outside the town he would effect the Kvitsas Aderich formula and then he would suddenly appear outside the town where he needed to be which also by the way as a footnote to that goes to show you that in fact uh, when it comes to Kvitsas Aderich there are no limits on luggage allowance because if you're taking an entire wagon and two horses. Now, outside towns, there would be a station where horses and wagons would be kind of parked, the 18th century equivalent of today's modern high-rise car park. You would park your wagon and your horses. You wouldn't take your wagon and your horses into the town. You'd park them there at the station. The horses would kind of be dealt with, and you'd go in, do your business, and come out. So the Baal Shem Tov would always kind of arrive with his horses and his wagon through Kvitsa Zaderech at one of these stations. So he, he arrives and he goes into a town to do what he needs to do. And the horses look at each other and they go, wait a minute, what, 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 what just happened here? Normally when we come to this station, we've already been through three or four other stations. But now we come here and no one's giving us a basin of oats and a trough of water. We got, we're not giving you anything to eat or drink. This is not what normally happens. Ah, say the horses. What must have happened is we're not horses. We're Bnei Odom. We're people. And people, they eat and they rest at the end of the day when they get to a hotel. So no doubt when we get to a hotel, we'll get something to eat and we'll rest. So the Baal Shem Tov comes out and then he zaps them to another location where he has to be. And they get there and he does his business and then he goes to another station and he even comes to a hotel but nothing's happening to the horses. They go, how is it that possible that we've been to all these stations and we haven't eaten and we haven't drunk anything? We're not horses. We're not even Bnei Adam. 
We must be malachim. We must be malachim. So the horses are convinced they're malachim. And eventually, when the Baal Shem Tov's finished all the missions he has to do, he brings, it's only a few hours have passed, he brings the horses and the, uh, and the wagon back to where he started. And then they bring in front of the horses a trough of water and a big basin of oats. And they completely fall on it and guzzle it all up because at the end of the day, they're horses. And uh, Sim Chabunim says to this guy, he goes, now you understand. He says, you can fast as many days as you like. But if you fast, and at the end of your fast each day, you sit down to a nice big plate of food and you ask, then at the end of the day, you're still basically a behemoth. He goes, the whole concept of fasting to become a more pure and refined person does not involve a cheshben of how many times you fast. And to completely finish off, I'm just going to, uh, not a story, but just a, an amazing vort that I saw, that I happened to see uh, in, uh, in Tiferes Yehonas, son of Rav Yehonas and Ibshitz, who talks about Kvitzas Aderech and leaves us with the thought that in the time of Mashiach, in the time of Mashiach, Kvitzas Haderech will be almost the standard mode of transport. He said, you'll be able, if, you want, if you're living in Chutz Laaretz and you want to offer a korban in Yerushalayim, and interestingly enough, he does it on a posuk in this coming week's parsha. Shama. He said, all you'll have to do is turn to Yerushalayim and will yourself to be there and instantly you'll be there. And uh, no doubt when, uh, when that happens, uh, we'll be meeting up again and uh, you'll be able to do uh, everything you'll need to do in, uh, in a, a fraction of the time. And uh, it has been uh, wonderful meeting some of you and I wish you well with the remainder of your travels and there is a lot that I haven't spoken about Kvitzas Aderek in this talk, but I just wanted to give a little overview. But there are technicalities, and those who want more of the detail of exactly how it's done uh, are welcome to speak to me later. But shkoch. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon.